Thank you. Um, so thank you to the National Bank for uh, selecting our paper uh, for the conference. Um, and you can all read the title. So this is Home Country Effects of Multinational Network Restructuring. We added to the title in times of deglobalization, given the topic of the, of the conference, so we have an even uh, better fit. Yeah? And we, uh, this is joint work with uh, Bernard Michel, who is somewhere in uh, the audience over here. Um, yeah, being the third paper uh, to speak on deglobalization, you typically have graphs that uh, return, obviously, in any presentation. So we have seen this graph, but just to tell you that our work, uh, which is going to be empirical, is going to be focused on this 2010-2020 uh, period. Call it deglobalization, globalization uh, what you want, but it's uh, the upward trend in the trade to GDP ratio that basically stagnates during this period. Um, and this has led to a, a, a shift in focus, uh, we can say. So um, we have started to look rather first at efficiency gains. This has uh, offered by global production and we have shifted attention towards uh, risk and reconfiguration of this global production in, in recent times due to, to this trend uh, that we see. I would say that's mainly the academic attention. Um, it also has changed like uh, popular concerns into popular hopes. Uh, from popular concerns that all of our jobs and all of the activity is offshore to, to other countries, and now maybe uh, some of this activity and jobs is uh, going to be brought back home. Yeah. Um, this, uh, we're obviously not the first uh, to look into this, and this analysis of, of deglobalization and supply chain risk, etc. There's many papers uh, out there recently that uh, look into this, uh, but I would say that um, most of these papers basically use trade data or these uh, international uh, inter-country input output tables uh, to look at this. Um, and this is where our paper is, is going to come in. We know that international trade is for uh, maybe two thirds is accounted for by multinational uh, networks. And so what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to have a, an empirical exercise um, focusing on, on micro data on multinational networks to gain some more insights from this perspective into this uh, period of deglobalization. So this is really where our uh, paper comes in. Huh? Um, we have many results in, in, in the paper uh, for the sake of time and the presentation. I'm going to distill two questions, basically, uh, that we can answer uh, using the data in our paper. And so we're going to use this large micro-level data set of European-based uh, multinational networks to answer two questions. And so one is, I mean, uh, very simple. If we look at the data, uh, do we see some indication of deglobalization in this period from the perspective of these uh, multinational networks? And so I'll, I'll be using our data set to present you some, uh, some facts and, uh, from our data on foreign network restructuring. And I'll add in uh, some, some link with nearshoring and friendshoring, which is also very popular when, when we talk about uh, deglobalization in policy circles uh, these days. Yeah? And so I'll show you what we, we do there. The second question we then ask is, uh, after answering or looking into the first question, is whether, if we see deglobalization, whether it brings back uh, activity to the home country. Uh, we have many outcomes in the paper. Today I will be focusing on value added and employment, so basically jobs and economic activity, whether uh, this is brought back. Yeah? Uh, due to the richness of our data set, we can look at different domestic margins of these multinational networks. So we can look at what is happening at the parent company. We can look at if there are uh, domestic affiliates, what is happening at these domestic affiliates. And obviously we can also look at the number uh, of domestic uh, affiliates. Yeah? There's more in the paper, but I will be focusing on some highlights uh, in my presentation today. Yeah? Um, time is short, yeah? so I already give you the, the take home. Um, and I could basically answer the questions with yes or no, but I'll be a little bit more uh, elaborate uh, on this. And then, so the first question, do we see uh, deglobalization in the form of foreign network restructuring? That's something that we can really ask from our data set. And there we say, okay, yes, uh, what we see is a trend towards deglobalization in these European-based multinational networks, especially in the second half of the decade that we are uh, looking into. Because what we see is we see an increasing trend of foreign control so the number of foreign affiliates is reduced by these networks. Huh? So we see more of those instances. Huh? 
What we also see is we, we see less foreign expansion, so an increase in um, the number of foreign affiliates. Huh? Uh, of those that we do see, we also see an increasing trend in foreign expansions to become more in line with the idea we would have about friendshoring and nearshoring, basically. Huh? Um, so that's something that we take uh, from our data. And then we move into the second question, does deglobalization bring activity back to the home country? Well, the, the short answer is no. Huh? Uh, a little bit more elaborate, we look uh, differently at foreign contraction episodes, foreign expansion episodes. For foreign contraction episodes, we do not see a lot. If anything, we see negative effects. Yeah? Uh, foreign expansion episodes, which would be more of a sign of globalization, yeah? um, we do see uh, positive effects there, both along the domestic extensive and intensive margin. Um, final point is here, we also look at uh, friendshoring and nearshoring. Um, and we look at whether friendshoring and nearshoring is, if this is a characteristic of the, the type of restructuring that we see, whether that induces systematic differences in the effects we find. Yeah? Um, at this stage, given our data, the answer is no. Uh, we don't see systematic uh, difference there. So that's the main um, take home of the paper. And now I'll, I'll spend the rest of my presentation in, in detailing how we get to this uh, results. Huh? And so I'll focus a bit on the data that we use, how we measure foreign restructuring in the data, and then I'll zoom into the results that really speak to these uh, two questions, uh, adding uh, nearshoring and friendshoring uh, uh, to the discussion. Yeah? Um, so first, the data. Um, the data is something that um, I have been constructing together with Anglos Theodorakopoulos. There is a different paper that nicely explains this. It's basically uh, uh, data that come from an underlying data source, which is the, the Orbis database, but we create a data set of worldwide affiliate networks of European parents. Yeah? Um, the data allows us to say some things, the data doesn't allow us to say uh, other things that we may want to like to answer, but we can't. So in that sense, it's important to realize that we have the worldwide extensive margin, so we know where affiliates are located everywhere in the world. Um, in terms of the intensive margin, employment at these affiliates, etc., we do not have that for all of the affiliates, we only have it for the European affiliates. Yeah? Um, so this is very good for our work because if we look at European-based multinationals, we will be able to say something on domestic affiliates um, as well. And there we have sales, employment and other uh, characteristics. In the end, this is a data set of about uh, a little bit more than 4 million uh, parent affiliate year um, observations. Yeah? This is the bigger data set that we constructed. We're taking out the 2010-2020 period to focus on this, uh, this deglobalization period. This gives us between 45,000 and 60,000 multinational networks uh, a year. One thing that we do in the paper, uh, which is relevant a bit to motivate our exercise, which I'm not going to show today, but we do estimate the uh, premium of multinational network parents over uh, parents of a domestic network, huh? uh, simply to get an indication of the, the size and the importance of multinationals in the domestic economy. Uh, we find very sizable premiums ranging in between 20 and 70 percent uh, more employment value added, etc. So that really um, uh, supports us in, you know, it's a good idea to look at these multinationals and whether uh, these activities come back because they may have some macro implications if there's uh, really large effects uh, going on. So that's about the data. Um, then let me briefly uh, talk you through the way we measure uh, foreign restructuring. So recall we have the worldwide number of affiliates, so we observe uh, affiliates in, in numbers, uh, not in the intensive uh, margin. So we're going to focus on changes in the number of affiliates in the network, huh? because this is what we can do with um, the data. Um, the first thing that we noted when we, when we started this, uh, when we looked at, into the dynamics of the number of affiliates, is that we find a, a substantial number of networks that are basically continuously changing, adding or dropping uh, affiliates, which basically rules out uh, uh, to our feeling uh, an analysis based on net annual changes. Huh? So we're not going to go for that, and we do something as uh, defining a restructuring episode. Huh? And so a restructuring episode um, of a network is going to be a number of uh, potential more than one consecutive years in which the number of affiliates changes. Uh, we focus on the number of foreign affiliates because we're interested in foreign restructuring. 
Yeah? Uh, the episode ends when you know, there's no more change in the number of affiliates. And so this could be one year, can be uh, more years. Yeah? I'm going to show you some graphs. Um, there's going to be a time indicator. The timestamp for an episode is the end year of that episode. Yeah? If you start uh, in 2010 and you end the episode in 2013, it's going to be there in 2013 in the graphs that I'll um, show you. Yeah? Um, and so in the end, uh, between 2010 and 2020, we have um, uh, 41,000 um, multinational networks because we do some uh, sample reduction to meaningfully identify episodes. And we find that 60% of our networks um, uh, go through at least one uh, foreign restructuring episode. 22% yeah? goes through two or more restructuring episodes. Um, a quarter of these episodes last more than one year. Yeah? So that makes um, our episode approach a sensible thing uh, to do. We also see that these episodes are uh, fairly uniformly spread over the years, so it's not that we have peaks in some years um, and, uh, and lows in, in other years. Once um, we have these episodes, we can actually look at um, the, the, the change in uh, the number of affiliates. And um, what we do is we, we simply uh, classify them into three types. Yeah? So there's an expansion, number of foreign affiliates increases, uh, uh, contraction, the number of affiliates uh, decreases, and we also have a limited amount of uh, what we label reshuffling. So you add one affiliate this year, you drop one next year, episode ends, the total number of affiliates uh, stays uh, the same. Yeah? Um, this is what we can do with our data, and um, the first thing that we do is, is when we want to talk about deglobalization, is we're going to say, okay, well, if we see contractions, well, contractions are a sign of, of deglobalization because the network is shrinking the number of uh, foreign affiliates, basically. Yeah? Um, and this is the trend that we, that we get, uh, uh, or, or the picture that we get from 2010 to 2019. 2020, we, can, we only have data up to 2020, so we cannot say whether there's any change in 2021, uh, so we cannot uh, determine whether there is an episode end. Yeah? What we get from the, the graph is that if we look at the, the dark gray bars, the dark gray bars are the number of contraction episodes that we see in a given year. Yeah? And what you clearly see from the data that we have is that in the second half of the decade, the number of foreign contractions actually starts to increase in our, in our data set. Yeah? Um, if you look at the, uh, well, the, the mid-gray bars, uh, um, this is the number of expansions. And you see that uh, initially the number of expansions is much larger than the number of contractions. But again, by the end of the decade, the number of uh, contractions actually starts to, uh, sorry, expansions starts to decrease. Uh, and you really see the switch occurring in the, um, the second half of the decade. Uh, in the very whitish light gray, yeah, there's the reshuffling uh, episodes that are small and seem relatively stable, especially in comparison with the um, other two. Yeah? So that's the first result that we, yeah, we actually see something going on in the data there that yeah, you, you could label this deglobalization. Yeah? There's more uh, foreign contraction, less foreign expansion of these multinational networks uh, from Europe. What we then do is we add a, well, a second piece or, or some heterogeneity there. Um, we're going to look at nearshoring and friendshoring um, in these data. And these are popular notions of specific restructuring outcomes, um, I would say, that especially came to the fore in these times of deglobalization. Yeah? And so nearshoring is simply going to mean that um, through the restructuring, yeah, uh, our network becomes geographically more concentrated. Yeah? Um, how do we do this? It's very simple. We take the distance from any affiliate to the parent. Yeah? We calculate the average distance in the network. Uh, we have an episode where the number of affiliates changes, so the average distance changes. Yeah? So the average distance, if it's decreasing, um, it's a feature of nearshoring. Uh, otherwise, it's not a feature of uh, nearshoring. Uh, Friendshoring um, has also become a, um, a popular uh, idea uh, to identify some restructuring. We also try to say something on that. Yeah? And Friendshoring means that you're going to allocate production towards more uh, politically or geopolitically uh, aligned countries, basically. So what we do there is we do exactly the same thing, but then rather than physical distance, we calculate average geopolitical distance. We go to the literature, we take this... Um, 
typical uh, indicator that has been used in the literature, and we use that to calculate um, average geopolitical distance within networks. Again, episode, uh, there's some change in the distance. If it decreases, uh, you're doing uh, friend shoring, basically. Yeah? Now, do we see friend and near shoring? Um, yeah, this graph actually sh shows you that, okay, again, in the second half of the decade, we see increasingly uh, friend shoring and near shoring. The graphs actually shows you uh, box plots. Yeah? So for each episode, it shows you the change at the end of the episode in uh, physical distance on the left-hand side and geopolitical distance on the right-hand side. Yeah? And so what you see is that by the end of the, the decade, much more of these changes actually become negative. Yeah? So you see uh, nearshoring and friendshoring in uh, the data here. Yeah? Um, I can also show you another graph. This is simply the share of episodes yeah, uh, that are characterized by this friendshoring or nearshoring characteristics, so that reduce these, uh, these distances. And you see that the share is uh, very much increasing in the second half of the decade, basically. Yeah? Um, you go from about 30% to 45%, so uh, there's a, a big um, increase there. Uh, and so we say, okay, well, uh, we do see some uh, trends towards deglobalization basically from um, our data. Uh, that's our answer to the, to the first question. Uh, so we use our data to uh, produce some of these stylized facts basically from um, the data. Um, the second thing we do is we go into the home country effects of uh, foreign restructuring. Uh, so what we do there is we have an uh, event uh, study approach to see uh, how different outcomes at domestic parents, domestic affiliates, basically respond to these uh, restructuring episodes. Right? And so it's an event study approach, so our events is you know, an episode ending, so this can be an expansion, uh, a contraction, reshuffling. And specifically for uh, contractions, we are going to differentiate between uh, contractions where at the end you have a strict positive number of affiliates, so you stay in multinational network. We also have some episodes that end where all affiliates are gone, so you stop being a network basically. Yeah? So this is what we're going to label contract and dissolve basically. Event uh, study approach, so we're going to have a time path of five years before the restructuring episode to five years after the restructuring episode, which we're going to normalize with respect to the uh, um, one year before uh, the episode, basically. Yeah? Uh, we have a bunch of outcomes we consider. I'm not going to show you results for, um, for all of them, but we'll get um, to that, basically. Yeah? Um, just yeah, um, one word maybe on the sample we are using to estimate this, we're using the sample of those networks that do not experience a foreign restructuring episode um, and those that experience one uh, um, uh, foreign restructuring episode yeah? because that makes it more clear what is before and after. Yeah? If you have two episodes, it's less clear what is, uh, well, it's clear what is before and after, but it's before and after at the same time. Yeah? So. Um, we uh, don't use these. So there's many results in the paper. You can have a look at um, all of them if you're interested, but I'm going to focus on a few that really help us answering this question. Does deep globalization bring back activity to the home country? And so in that sense, I'm going to focus on the results for these contraction episodes, um, and I'll be looking at value added and employment, which are probably the most, um, well, uh, visible uh, variables that you want to look at in terms of bringing jobs and activity back. Yeah? I'm going to show results for both uh, parents and uh, domestic affiliates. And then it will be domestic affiliates that are there before and after um, the uh, episode. And then I'm going to look at the extensive margin as well, whether domestic affiliates are added, um, yes or no. Yeah? Um, so here's the, um, the first uh, result that I... I'm going to show you, so this, so this is for, uh, recall, foreign contraction episodes. This is what happens with value added at uh, parents on the left-hand side and at affiliates on the right-hand side. Uh, left-hand side, we differentiate between uh, uh, contracting networks and contracting and dissolving networks. Uh, and so the dots are contracting networks, the diamonds yeah, are point estimates for networks that um, actually dissolve and cease to be a network. Uh, and so the period zero is basically the end of the episode. Everything to the left is before the episode. Everything to the right is um, after the episode. Yeah? 
And so what you clearly see from the graphs is that there is this, uh, this, this downward trend. And uh, for sure, uh, does deglobalization bring back activity? Uh, we don't see any upward trend. Huh? So um, if anything, there is a, a negative effect that we, we see in terms of value added at parent and uh, domestic affiliates. So not bringing back any activity to the, to the home country. Yeah? Uh, we have the same graphs for employment and for uh, other outcomes. Huh? Um, we basically see the same. Huh? Um, so there's no, no positive effect, not bringing any jobs back, not in the form of uh, an increase in employment at the parent, neither at domestic affiliates. Yeah? So shutting down uh, foreign affiliates does not bring back um, jobs to the home uh, country. Yeah? One other uh, potential uh, mechanism would be that rather than bringing jobs back to the parent or existing affiliates, uh, you set up a new affiliate. Yeah? This is something that we can also check. Um, here from the graph, you see that, okay, well, the graph suggests, if you look from, from far away, that there might be this, this, this upward trend. But basically, if you look at confidence intervals um, and you exclude the minus 5 and the minus 4, there's nothing going on. Huh? So there's really no systematic uh, uh, bringing back of um, domestic uh, affiliates. Yeah? And so um, I can basically summarize the previous one uh, with a simple no. Huh? So the key takeaway is no, huh? there are no signs of bringing back activity to the, to the home country. Huh? And then we can elaborate a little bit on this. Um, and there's full results in the paper, but I'm not going to talk you through these today. So I've just shown you or given you a flavor of what we do. And, and um, the other variables result in the same. Uh, there's not a single variable where we find some indications of a potential positive effects following these uh, contraction episodes. Yeah. Um, that's basically what we say about uh, deglobalization. Um, it's also interesting because we can actually use our data also to say something on expansions, right? Um, and we can look at expansions in a period of deglobalization because many people have looked before at the effects of expansions and how it relates to uh, domestic activity, but maybe not in a period of deglobalization. So there's a little bit of value added in doing that exercise as well. I'm not going to show you the results, but I'm going to give you the, the key takeaway. Um, and uh, we actually confirm earlier literature in the sense that earlier literature has uh, concluded uh, that, okay, if anything, there's likely to be a positive correlation. So if you expand foreign activities, uh, you're going to expand domestic activities, for sure not uh, reducing it. Uh, this is also something that we find for these foreign expansions in the period we consider. They confirm a complementarity between domestic and foreign activity rather than, uh, than a substitution. So we also find it in, uh, in that direction. Again, a full list of results um, in the paper um, which I'm not going to discuss over here. And I'll just take you through the last um, exercise that we, we do in the paper. So we also want to link these home country effects that we did to um, a potential heterogeneity in terms of some of these episodes are characterized by French shoring and near shoring, um, others are not, uh, basically. Yeah? And so in order to do that, we um, simply extend our uh, analysis or event study with an interaction effect, uh, making a difference between episodes that are uh, characterized by friend and nearshoring and episodes that are not characterized by friend and nearshoring. Um, this gives us uh, potentially different parts. I say potentially because we find no systematic differences between contraction and expansion episodes, uh, whether or not they are characterized by friend or nearshoring. Um, the only caveat there is that we saw that, okay, friend and nearshoring especially take place near the end of uh, our sample. So it may, uh, if we could add some data and have some, some uh, longer time span, we might uh, start to see something, but uh, based on our data that we have for now, we don't find um, anything there. And so I think I still have one minute uh, to conclude, and I can just reiterate, I think, the, the main things that we, uh, we do is we use this large micro-level data set on multinational networks in Europe. So it's European-based multinational networks. We try to answer two questions or contribute uh, to uh, start to having an answer to two questions. Do we see deglobalization in the form of foreign network restructuring? from uh, this micro-level perspective. Yes, uh, we do. We see it especially in the second half of um, the decade. Yeah? 
Uh, does deglobalization bring back activity to the home country? Uh, short answer is, you know, based on what we do and what we have in our data, no, it doesn't. Uh, so there is no um, jobs or activity or uh, increase in domestic affiliates. We don't see this. Um, and that concludes my presentation. So thank you for your attention.